Hello, this is Robert James Fremantle, and I've been playing Dark Angel Space Marine so much so now that I've even got the hair like one, so which is interesting. Uh, and we're going to be showing you, me and me, all about what happened as a vidcast uh, by way of attempted recollection. Now, you know, when it comes to trying to remember what has happened to make a vidcast, it's usually better to do it closer to the time of actually having done it. And so a little bit of time has gone, so I'm going to try and remember as much as I can. And then hopefully we can actually start getting these out live. I also don't want to take too long in trying to explain all of this to you. So let's... Uh, I've got my notes page here that I took while we were playing as well, so I'll, I'll just use that as a bit of an aid. Right, so Laurie's guardsman Darius and my cleric Solomon, they started off together, and they'd been called to a moon base, uh, the interrogator's moon base. So along they go. There's an, um, an ogrin at the door, and he wants to take names before he lets people in. And Solomon makes uh, Darius do the talking because he doesn't even want to talk to him. And they say, "Oh yeah, there's 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 food and drink in there. Help yourself. Eat, eat as much as you want." And um, uh, Solomon doesn't want to eat or drink of any of it. He said that uh, he prefers suffering. And plus, when his stomach, you know, growls, it sounds like it's angry. Uh, He's a, he's a real psycho, you have to remember, this cleric. He's a real total psycho. And uh, then we met the psycho character and the assassin character. And they, they both had their their stories that led them to appear at the room as well. And we met the... Uh, we met the Inquisitor and two interrogators. And they explained... Look, okay, uh, this is going to be your point of contact, one of the interrogators. He's going to go with you. He's a bit of a, a, a cowboy type, really, you know. And um, the other two were going to stay there. They said, right, you've got to go down to Scintilla and figure out what the hell has happened. There's been a, um, a rash of disturbances, and we are concerned that there's going to be full-scale riot, that the people are going to completely turn, and the situation is going to go out of control, and I want you to unroot whatever is at the bottom of it. Please investigate. And uh, it turned out that we were going to have a point of contact with the Arbites down there on the ground. So we went on down, took a transport, went to the uh, police station place. Uh, I got given a badge to hold to show that I was part of the Inquisition. We were told really to attempt to remain undercover as much as possible so that you know we don't give uh, it away to too many people as is normal in investigations such as these. I just want to say from the off that the GM has done a, a fabulous job of rendering the world uh, for us in in a way that is very easy to understand and easy to believe so you can really see that he's got confidence in his own system in his own world so that's always that's always good to experience someone happy digging their own vision and um, you know dealing it out confidently and yeah we see this uh, this queue of like seemingly prisoners going in and um, some sort of uh, bureaucratic station, desks everywhere and shouting and things going on and lines of people filing this way and that way. It's just chaos everywhere. And we find out we need to go to the fourth floor. And we eventually, with a bit of hard talking and slight flashing of the badge at the correct uh, law enforcement type person, so that they'll actually take you seriously, heading to see Proctor Donald. So we speak, speak to him, and he gives us the official report there in the station, saying, OK, well, uh, we've got a factory that uh, seven months ago people were disappearing, and they found no bodies, and three months ago the whole factory got closed, other stuff's been going on, and then three dead people turned up. So it's 
And there's no clear signs of how they died either, and there's nothing. Anyway, our interrogator says he's going to be waiting for us at the Barking Saint uh, at the Underhive. His name is Quintilus. And this is a period of time, by the way, that's quite a, a way forward ahead chronologically, and quite a number of um, inquisitors have been killed off seemingly. So something appears to be going on. A number of them have been ousted as heretics and some bad stuff's gone down. So we're actually almost getting towards the dawn of the 42nd millennium. I wonder if GW's ever going to do that with their, with their license. Do you think they ever will? That it'll be Warhammer 41k. What do you reckon? Mm, don't know. Right, anyway. It would be cool if they did. You know, I, I, think, I think, you know, uh, every couple of decades, maybe. You know, move it on 100 years, eh? Well, go on, why not? <laughs> right, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> we decide to follow up on several different leads because the people that turned up dead, there was no way of determining uh, how they died. They just seemed to have dropped dead. Uh, furthermore, a psyker had been called in to scan the area previously. Uh, it was a freelancer who came and left, so we can't get access to that psyker. And the psyker said that uh, from his scans, he can't seem to make contact with the departed. And as such, their souls apparently no longer exist, if that makes any sense. So, yeah... That doesn't sound good. And straight away, I started thinking, uh, myself and one other member of the party actually were thinking, hmm, gene stealer cult? Maybe? Or does that seem too obvious? I don't know, but there was talk of, from a bit of digging around, we find out there's there's been a heretic down on the scene and he's been causing trouble. But maybe that's just a red herring, because maybe this heretic was initially there causing trouble and something else has come over and said, we're taking your show over. You always have to be careful. Sometimes the picture can actually be bigger than it first appears, but you can't uh, try and let your Im imagination run off to be, you know, to determine what it is in things like this. You just have to try and discover it. Anyway, it also turned out that a number of people had recently been arrested. People in gangs trying to break into the factory. And a lot of them had been bailed out. But some of them were still in holding cells. So we go back over and we decide, well, the couple that we can get access to that still haven't been bailed out, we'll talk to them. So one of them is from a gang called The Six Rounds. And, uh, yeah, our psyker goes in, does a whole sort of, is in the interrogation room, the sort of fear aura thing and says, you will tell me, and, you know, frightens the crap out of him, and he's pretty much crapping himself, so, you know, literally. Um, and he says, you know, I, I, seriously, I, I, I don't know what's, uh, what it was, you know, uh, I think it was caught in the ventilation shafts, trying to go that way. It was a contact, and in, 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 in these cases it seems that a contact had sent them in, but the contact was shadowy. So then I go to I go to the other cell with Solomon, and a, a guy who's from um, a from old school or whatever they're called, and uh, they use a lot of Arbity's gear that uh, they acquire. So um, it turns out that Solomon does his willpower persuade crazy thing. And he, sa he says, oh, yeah, well, you know, I'm a cleric. I'm here for your absolution. You know, make the confession. And, and he does this amazing, amazing role, <laughs> this convincing role, like a zero seven 7 or something, to say, look, you, you just tell me what you know and I'll, and I'll cut you a deal. I'll sort something out. And we find out, yeah, it was a guy that was uh, hired these people to do it, and their contact was going to go back through and uh, get in touch 
with them, but they were going to be meeting buyers of a particular item that harvest souls or something like that. Something of the heretics, perhaps, that we think. And the buyers were going to meet at the Barking Saint, where, of course, Quintilus is gone. And every time we try and contact Quintilus, you know, he's partying, he's having a good time, you know, he's he's, he's, he's chatting women up and, and knocking back drinks and all sorts. We then uh, get the blueprints of the warehouse. Um, I've had a, a chance with the cleric to do uh, a couple of times where we've stopped for prayer and done a, uh, a, a litany that is considered... Uh, that is considered suitable for the occasion and that's been a nice opportunity actually being able to do that it would be really nice as I said last time you know if we can actually put some of these sessions out live for you know for you guys probably to ease the load on as voice only and if we were going to see anything maybe the uh, Roll20 interface you actually using Roll20 has been really really helpful because it's one thing to sort of imagine and say, okay, you know, there's a corner here and you run to Hitler and such and such. But I suppose when you've got the, the, the tactical overhead and you're looking at your guys and you're actually moving them um, by the mechanics and you're saying, right, I'm firing from here, I think somehow that stays with you more. And I know you can come away with a sense that you have experienced it, but to actually, rather than have to imagine the dimensions, to actually see them is, is something else entirely. So it really, you don't get an interpretive vision like you'd have to end up with in a novel. You actually get the GM's own vision. And I suppose it depends, like, what you're going for. Because, you know, some GMs doing a storytelling, you know, you help to create your own vision. It's not necessarily a bad thing because, you know, it works for books, doesn't it? So, you know, why couldn't it work for an RPG? But I think it's something that I find most interesting and... and um, easy to uh, find memorable and enjoyable some of the uh, intricacies of, of um, battle engagements and sometimes tactically how they give you a chance to actually portray your character. Because you've got also an, uh, another danger is that combat can just turn into a roll fest. But when you're trying to do combat in such a way as placement, positioning, um, style of, of that combatant, then you are still role playing, you know. So there's a way to fight like your character as well, right? So, <coughs> and of course, my guy is nuts. He's tactical minded, but it doesn't come from like um, savvy. It just comes from sheer malice. That's where it comes from. He he can't afford to get shot. He's got to stay alive so he can burn the other guy to cinders, you know. His name is Holocaustos, after all, so as a surname, which is burnt offerings. As a, that's the reason. Uh, yeah, seems that the um, the bodies we couldn't determine anything to do with the bodies after we checked uh, an autopsy on them. So we pressed ahead, went for the factory. We couldn't get hold of our uh, guy, our contact Quintilus at that point, to say, you know, what should, what should we do about going into the factory? We see a guard on the door, because we decide that it's all been happening in the factory, we've got to check the factory, that's it, isn't it, really? And uh, the guard doesn't want to let us in. We say, come on, we, we just want to come in, and he says, no, look, you're going to be in too much danger, you know, you fools, how do I know you've got the proper authority? And, this, and you know, we insist we have, and we show that we've got licenses to be able to carry weapons and armor. But still, it's not licenses to prove that we can officially investigate this. And if I wanted to show them that I had a license to officially investigate this, I would have to show yet someone else proof that we were acolytes within the Inquisition. And you don't really want to flash that around too much. So I ended up saying, look, okay, you doubt whether or not. We are investigators. Well, I can tell you that these people are with me, and what you can't doubt is that I am uh, a member of the Ministorum Oratorus. I am a cleric. And as such, uh, because you know that is true, and because I've got the paperwork here to show you that that's what I am, 
grant me entry, even on the basis, to sanctify this place in the name of the emperor. And these are my security detail. Well, you know, it convinced him. He let us in and said, well, you know what? It's dangerous in there. And my guy says, you know, I'm here to be used. I'm a tool of the ecclesiarchy. And we have no fear. And death is nothing and sacrifice is nothing. For the emperor has made the greatest sacrifice of all. So, in his usual kind of crazy way, he's still holding back, really, and not letting the the madness out of the box. And again, this is a, a lot of it's all my perspective, and hopefully you should be actually seeing these characters in action if we can get some live stuff out, because obviously my, my recollections on this are purposely quite slim as to what all these characters are really like. And... Uh, the reason is because I don't want to take ages all just talking about it when you'd get to know them anyway in live play, hopefully. So, but this is just to recap the bit that wasn't put out live. Right. So, we're in the middle of the factory. We get in. The door's shut behind us. And it's almost pitch black in there. And there's a little bit of light. And there's a bit of light coming from my flamethrower. So, that lights things up somewhat. And, um... We're moving along down the way. We've got an all specs, and the all specs picks up signs of life. Right, and we know this place has got the ground floor, a basement, and two more floors up to a roof. Suddenly, yeah, the all specs picks up like ten people simultaneously, and then the ten people on the all specs just stop. And then we, our assassin, sneaks out and finds ten bodies on the floor exactly in the position where the all specs readings went up and I was like oh do you think they've dropped from the ceiling how did they get there you know the all specs went off because of sudden movement all right it's a sensor so how did they suddenly move unless they were all standing there momentarily and all died simultaneously at once at the same just boom like that, and that's the movement we picked up suddenly. And it ri it was freaking us out. And at that point, our psyche, something kept attacking her mind. Something kept trying to get in and take her over, and she kept having to do uh, resistances to try and stop it happening. And she said, look, I really want to get out of here. And by the time it had happened like a third time, she was like, look, we have to leave. I'm not comfortable with being here anymore. So we all agree, all right, look, we'll get out of there. So we back out and we head for the door. Just on her insistence, really, you know, if we can get her outside and let her take a breath, then, you know, at least stop her mind coming under attack so that we can figure out what to do with this new knowledge in place. We couldn't leave, though, because the door was no longer there. It was just a wall. This is where things started getting crazy, okay? Just wall. And it's hammering on it, banging on it. Some of the characters are, and, you know, checking it, and it just seems like the wall. And the wall just hasn't changed in any way. It's still the same wall. We haven't teleported or anything like that. It's just, it's not a door there anymore. It's just wall. And, uh, Solomon smiles while they're all panicking and freaking out. And then he starts laughing. He starts laughing and, and, and shouts, turns around and shouts into the darkness and says, right. You want to test me. You want to bring out the best in me. And that's exactly what you're going to get. You'll find that I am not found wanting if you want to test my faith. So, are we going to play this game then? And sort of walks on into the dark with hands out and laughing. Basically, the sadist has kicked in in him. <laughs> He's just gone crazy. And the others are like, Look, okay, just follow him. You know, he seems to know what he's doing. Now, at this point, I'm getting whispered um, on the separate chat thing that we've got open there by the GM, and he's able to give us 
specific information, which is a great thing that I sometimes use at the table with uh, uh, post-it notes and stuff. So he he can do like whispers and things. And um, you know, th my character's getting this feeling coming into his head. Uh, go up, go up. You must go up. Just a compulsion to go up. So I push on through this place. And we do. We, we go up. Up through the stairs. And, you know, as we do so, this force, this malignance, this something other than us presence is there and grows stronger. And then this sound of somebody crying. It sounds like a, a child crying. And it's continuous. And we, see it's, we seem to be heading in the right direction towards it. And we go up and we find uh, the second floor there. And that's got all the, the paperwork. And we go up again. You know, just pushing on through. And the place gets really, really cre creepy. And it's really dark. And, and um, we go up to the, the next place. The next floor up. And, uh, I mean, by now... We're actually shoving along, and the fog of war on the map is closing up, swallowing up behind us. So we can actually see ourselves being enveloped and pushed along this passage, as it were. It's like, it's like something is forcing us down this route towards our demise. It's almost like we we are food, and we've been swallowed, and this 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 building is just part of uh, the digestion process now. You know, that's a horrible way to think about it, but I'm going to tell you this. If Solomon is food, right, then equipped with his flamer as he is, he's going to cause some pretty bad indigestion. But anyway, we come to this uh, really long corridor thing that just seems to go on and on forever, and there is doors that just keep coming off of it all the way along, and they're like all locked all the way along. But there's one in particular that there's a mass compulsion for me to want to open it. And I tell the others, look, you know, I'm wanting to open it. In, you know, in my Irish kind of uh, fanatical Catholic priest, sort of uh, sounds like a, he could be a Garth Ennis character, written character kind of way. Uh, <laughs> you know, gritty sort of Irish demeanour. Um, you know, grind his fist in glass and and gravel and sort of punch you with it and <laughs> and then make the the the, the holy sign <laughs> kind of thing. You know, just a complete nutter. I said, well, you know, someone else should uh, open that door other than me, seeing as this is making me want to do it. So they open the door and head on through, and I head on through, and we carry on along. And um, at the, I think it is the, at the top floor we come to what seems to be some sort of electrical generator room. So there's these big generator points with wires that uh, the cabling things that link them all up and electricity is keeps passing through this circuit. So it's going from this big electrical unit passing down into something set up there that it's juiced up into which is again also all connected to a looks like a sort of uh, bathtub thing filled up with green fluid took a look in there and it's empty I was wondering if it was some sort of like stasis machine or or what have you and the um, there was no way that we could uh, interact with anything in the room because we don't have the right technical know-how or skills so really just mess with things and there's the bits of machinery and there's the crates and there's some other um, strange looking potentially volatile chemical um, boxes or, or canisters or, or whatever so it's some sort of science laboratory slash engineering room type place and we come under attack we come under attack from a bunch of uh, guys seemingly in, I think it was, um, I think one of them at least had Arbity's armour. He seemed to be some sort of a gang member or something. So they've got something going on in there. And 
yeah, it it was. We started moving tactically around the room. And our assassin is very melee based and uh, found that he was taking crap loads of damage. And as the battle went on, he was taking even more and getting close to death. Uh, Darius taking cover and shooting out from his position. And our psyker waiting for the opportunity and then trying to manipulate and control and damage from a distance. We all went X-Men, you know, doing our own thing. My guy's running around and he runs to cover and tries to get off a shot there and then the assassin runs forward and blocks his flame view so he has to run to a different part of cover and he, he gets two guys in view because it's a, a, um, a 10 meter cone shot. So Solomon fires off the flamethrower. It uh, hits one guy and sends him a light. Uh, the other guy dives out of the way to avoid it but it sends the canister up. It's volatile it blows, injures like about four of the guys, uh, wipes a whole bunch of them out, almost pretty much just turning the tide of the battle and almost finishing it right there, and pretty much near killing our poor assassin into the bargain. I didn't know it would explode, I was just trying to hit two guys, so <laughs> I caught him in it, and you know, there's still someone alive and wailing on him and he's fighting back and you know he's practically dead now at this point I mean he's on the critical table and just about still standing somehow and we we just couldn't believe it we just couldn't believe that the guy was still alive somehow and just hanging in there and somehow by some madness even though he'd already given up on his character found hope again and then given up on his character once more during the space of just that one fight, he survived somehow, and we somehow won that battle, and pressed on. Really very, very strange. So, what is at the centre of all this? In this big electrical room powering something, and it was my mind, you know, let's turn it off, break it down. Another thing interesting was that there was health kits available here and there. So if it is some sort of engineering room, then they've got first aid stations on hand based around the room. So that was interesting. Now, because of the almost dreamlike nature of what's going on, I do wonder if somehow, from the point of us entering this factory, if something within the factory is somehow subverting reality as far as our consciousness knows and hopefully I'd be able to snap out of it pretty soon because I've got pure faith and at least can't be manipulated too much by uh, demons so we'll have to see that's pretty much where we are right now and you know, I would love for us to be able to carry on with you live to take this up. So, let's see what happens next.